Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Daily Gray Refuel, where we recap the latest news in the Ethereum ecosystem. I'm your host, Anthony Sassano, and today is the 6th of September, 2022. All right, everyone, let's get into it. So the Bellatrix upgrade just went live on the Ethereum beacon chain about uh, half an hour ago from time of recording here, uh, which means next up is the mainnet merge, which is going to be happening in, I, I think, around nine to 10 days. Obviously, with TTD, it's hard to estimate. But the Bellatrix upgrade itself went through amazingly. Uh, we only had about a 5% drop off in participation rate, as you can see here, uh, from the, the epics that followed uh, after 144896. You can see that yeah about five percent of validators dropped off which is an amazing result because as you'll know from the test nets we had much more than that drop off right i think with with girl we had like 40 percent drop off or something but given this is main net given there is real money on the line um people are much more attentive here and you can already see <clears throat> the participation rate going back up you can see at the uh, epic that bellatrix activated here at 896 it was uh, uh, well sorry i should say 897 it's 94.49 percent and then just a couple of ep uh, or a few epics later we're back up to around 96.1% here on 901. So that should go back up to over 99% as we've kind of like saw uh, normally, you know, prior to the Bellatrix upgrade and everything should be fine then. So all in all, a really, really great upgrade here. And now the beacon chain is ready for the merge. So really we're just waiting for TTD to happen now. And then uh, the merge transition will go through, as I said, around nine to 10 days for that to happen. Now I wanted to go through a little bit of things with you guys uh, with regards to... I guess things like participation rate, how the mer main merge can go wrong and, and things like that, because I've been seeing a lot of questions being asked about this. So what I mean by participation rate here is you can see this number on my screen. This is basically the percentage of the net of the validators that these, these validators, right? The uh, 421,509 active validators that are actively attesting to blocks. Now, obviously it's never going to be a hundred percent. It would be very rare for it to be, to be a hundred percent because there is always going to be someone offline here or there uh, or something happening here or there, right? But most of the time it has been 99.6, 99.7%, which is a huge amount uh, considering how many validators there are. Now, this drops off for a number of different reasons. As I said, if someone goes offline, that means that after a few... Um misattestations, misattestation, depending on how big and chain, the big and chain explorer accounts it, they wouldn't be part of this participation rate that is that is here now, right? That would be kind of like marked as offline because they aren't actively attesting to blocks uh, and they aren't actively participating in the network anymore. Obviously, uh, if you're slashed and you're kind of um, getting exited from the 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 beacon chain, you're not exited at time of slashing, you go into the queue and then you exit after that. Uh, but I think off, being offline is is really the biggest thing when it comes to participation rates. People just go offline for a number of different reasons. Maybe misconfiguration, their internet goes offline, their power's gone out, right? There's plenty of reasons why someone would go offline. And that's actually why the penalty for going offline is, is very low, right? Like for example, if you're offline for a day and then you're online for the next day, your rewards would net out to zero. You just basically make back all the all the um, ETH that you lost for that day that you you've been offline in the, the next day that you're online. So that, but it does scale kind of like quadratically from there. If you are offline, at the same time as a bunch of other people are offline, well, then you may end up losing more because the network could view that as an attack. A, a, a scenario where this might happen is if there's a client that has a bug. Say you're running one of the, the clients uh, that maybe has 10% share of the network and all of a sudden has a bug in it which sends all of them offline or sends all of them onto the, the wrong chain head. Well, then you may end up losing more ETH because of that because the network sees that and like, okay, well, there's a quadratic in inactivity leak that kicks in there. So there are a bunch of different reasons for that, they, that these kind of like things can happen here but as i said the fact that we only lost about five percent of validators after a major network upgrade such as as bellatrix is a very very positive sign now in terms of how this can play out on mainnet and how things can go wrong post merge right once the merge transition goes through i'm obviously expecting some people to fall off for some reason right there are there are as i explained there are many different reasons why people fall off i don't expect us to have 100 percent or near 100 percent participation rate per immediately post merge but because this is mainnet because there is more money on the line i think i expect it to be fixed relatively quickly now I, people have been asking me you know what is the worst case scenario that could happen uh through the merge transition that would you know lead to a, a quote-unquote failed merge 
there's actually only one situation that I can think of, and that really is that for some reason, the merge transition itself across all clients just failed catastrophically. It just didn't happen, right? The chain just halted. No blocks were being produced at all. Uh, everyone was confused about what the chain head was, and we didn't come to consensus on anything. That would be, in, in my, from my understanding, the worst case scenario, which would require, obviously, coordinated human intervention to either roll back to the proof of work chain uh, or a to a proof of work consensus mechanism uh, or to fix whatever the, the issue is there. Now, the chances of that happening are basically 0% in my eyes. It's, it's always uh, you know possible that it could happen, but it's more about what's probable. I don't expect that to happen. What I do expect to happen, or at least is more likely to happen, is that we have a big participation uh, drop off. Now, I don't, I, I don't expect a big participation drop off. Maybe a small one, like five percent, as we've seen here. Maybe ten percent. I don't even know if it'll be that big because of the fact that there's real money on the line. But the worst case scenario in that would be uh, people uh, enough um, validators going offline. Well, actually, I should say there's two kind of like bad scenarios there. Enough validators falling offline that we stop finalizing. So that would mean that thirty three percent, I believe, or thirty four percent. Of validators would have to fall offline for us to stop finalizing. And then for the chain to halt altogether, I believe that would happen if there was less than 33% of the network online, the chain would just stop producing blocks. I, I think that. So there, there are different thresholds there. Now for that to happen, I mean, like that's crazy. It would, it would require, because we, we fixed the client diversity on the consensus layer side, uh, it would require, I believe, both Prism and Lighthouse to just be offline, off, off the network for that many validators to be offline <clears throat> at once right and then on the execution layer side it would probably just require geth i believe so obviously not as great there and that's why a catastrophic bug in geth wouldn't be great post merge uh and catastrophic i mean like a critical bug like a, a consensus breaking bug that that sends geth off onto its own fork or something like that so th that's really the only things that I, that people should really be not, I wouldn't say concerned about, but should be aware of, uh, because at, at the end of the day, a, a failed merge is actually a very hard thing to do. The beacon chain is self-healing. It's very, very resilient. It can recover from these sorts of things. And we've seen it recover from some pretty shitty uh, uh, situations, such as the girly testnet merge, which actually saw the chain not finalizing for a, a few epics there because of the fact that we had that massive drop off, but that quickly rectified itself. And that's a testnet. I don't expect that to play out on mainnet. And as we've just seen, 5% uh, only fell off during the Bellatrix upgrade, which is a very, very good result there. Uh, and the chain just keeps chugging along. We're finalizing. Everything's fine. This is on the real beacon chain. This is not a test net. This is mainnet beacon chain. So in terms of protecting yourself from these sorts of things, I mean... <laughs> If you want to be 100% protected, the only thing you're actually going to be able to do is not have any assets on Ethereum at all. And that would mean selling your assets for, I don't know, some other crypto asset or or, or, or real dollars, not stable coins, right? Because the stable coins are on Ethereum, of course, like real actual dollars on an exchange. Because... This is a consensus level change. The merge changes from proof of work to proof of stake. It affects the entire chain, uh, but it doesn't affect all the individual apps or anything like that. Like it's a consensus change, which means that it, the only thing it's doing is swapping out proof of work for proof of stake. So if you have ETH in Aave or ETH in Maker or ETH in some other smart contract, it doesn't matter. If something was to go wrong with the merge, it would affect every single contract equally. It doesn't have any preference or doesn't affect any contract uh, specifically uh, di differently to any other one out there because there's just nothing being changed on that side of things. So if you want to protect yourself from, I don't know, any chance of anything going wrong, you just don't want to be part of any potential mess, then the only thing you can do is not hold any assets on Ethereum at all, on like on chain at all. You would have to just basically go to dollars. Now, obviously that is not a workable solution for a lot of people because doing that would incur a lot of taxable events so at the end of the day you should just chill like there's not really anything else that that you should you should do as I, as i've said before you end users aren't going to feel anything different if, if the merge goes through successfully as we as we expect it will, then the only thing end users may feel is that slightly faster block time of 12 seconds instead of 13 seconds. But really, I don't really think people are going to even notice that. So just chill. And if you want to take advantage or try to take advantage of any of the Ethereum proof of work forks, 
look, I have talked about these before. Really, at the end of the day, like the way to take advantage of it is just to have ETH in your own Ethereum address and then you'll get like the fork tokens on the other chain and then you can do whatever you want with that. But I've said before how I believe that this is potentially dangerous, something that doesn't really, that, that probably won't be as profitable as you think it will uh, and might be worth more hassle than, um, than the money you'll get from it. But it's up to you what you want to do with that. I'm not going to be putting out any guides on how to take advantage of that or anything like that. Uh, I have warned before that, as I said, it's potentially dangerous due to the risk of replay attack and things like that but at the end of the day that's up to you to to do that so yeah uh i i expect the merge transition to go through smoothly uh we've done it so many times and i mentioned yesterday how shadow fork uh 12 went through perfectly the clients all seem to be working very very well together uh, and if you're worried about being on a majority client well then you should be running minority clients right you shouldn't be running get you should be running one of the other execution layer clients and on the consensus layer side if you're really worried then you shouldn't be running prism or lighthouse you should be running one of the other consensus layer clients uh, on there as well but but yeah hopefully that gives a more in-depth overview of what uh risks are associated with the merge what can go wrong what's likely to to happen what's not likely to happen all in all the merge uh is, is going to be a smooth transition i believe I, I don't think there's going to be anything uh anything catastrophic happening here uh, and i'm just like so pumped for it i mean i typed out my tweet before about uh the um the, the tweet that i showed at the start here about palatrix going live and i said wow the merge is actually happening in less than nine days right that that's just stupidly close i mean <laughs> i I don't know. I don't know what else to say. I've said this so many times. I'm not going to rehash myself here, but that is really stupidly close now. So we are in the end game. We're almost home, uh, and I'm very, very excited about that. But, uh, but yeah, I'm gonna leave that one at that. Uh, Beacon Chain is the main website I use to keep track of all this sorts of stuff, but there's also Beacon Scan. So that it has various statistics around the Beacon Chain itself, such as, you know, active validators, uh, what finalized, e the current and finalized epics, uh, the transaction, sorry, not the transactions, the pending validators, the participation rate, and obviously post-merge will have things like, uh, well, I mean, that'll have kind of like uh, Ether Scan and Beacon Scan that you can kind of look at for different layers here. Uh, so yeah, these are the two sites that I mainly use if you want to keep up with what's happening on the beacon chain or the consensus layer side itself. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, Adrian Sutton explained that we only lost 5% of the validators after the Bellatrix fork, as I explained, and Terence has a nice picture of uh, the Bellatrix upgrade going, uh, going through. And you can see on the bottom, it says ready for the merge, which I saw on my staking box. I actually watched it happen live. I was staring at my, at my command line. And I'm just like, yep, yep. Oh, there it is. There's Bellatrix, right? And then it said ready for the merge. And I'm like, I am so ready for the merge. Like, <laughs> I, I know how you feel, little command line. So so that went through there. But yeah, that's all the merge updates. I think they're uh, very, very successful Bell Bellatrix upgrade. And uh, yeah, less than nine days until the mainnet merge. Obviously, there is the mainnet merge call that I'll be doing with ETH Staker and the Bankless guys. Uh, and I don't, like nine nine days from now, I think is a weekend. Uh, so maybe I, I, I won't be doing a refuel on uh, the, the mainnet net merge day but maybe, maybe i'll have to do a special one if it falls on the um the weekend just like a, a special refill to celebrate the merge but anyway it's coming very very soon uh i'm super excited of course uh and yeah that's all on the merge but there is one other thing here from proto lambda he just had a screenshot of a message that he put into the uh, the uh, into a Discord channel here, where he said some anon who I respect very much co uh, commented about block building slash uh, TWAP oracle abuse slash centralization of DeFi data providers. The pes pessimistic view of post merge Ethereum. Yes, it's bad. No, not net negative. Don't drop the ball now if the merge is not your main quest. So basically what he's saying here is that because of the fact that the proposers are known ahead of time in proof of stake Ethereum, there is a possibility of multi-block MEV, which I've discussed before on the refuel. And I've also discussed all of the solutions that are coming to mitigate, if not eliminate, all of that, such as proposer PBS, uh, censorship, uh, more censorship resistance, such as CR lists, uh, vertical trees, uh, uh, AVM improvements, and all these sorts of stuff. And that's what Proto Lambda is saying here, is basically that the merge is going to free up a lot of uh, resources for these other upgrades that have been put on the back burner because the merge was such a monumental undertaking that it really nothing else on, on the core development side could be focused on in any real capacity. But now that the merge is less than nine days away, we're going to be moving towards that, especially when it comes to MEV. Because look, multi-block MEV, the reason why it can get bad is not just TWAP Oracle abuse or manipulation. So TWAP stands for time-weighted average price. And basically a TWAP Oracle is an Oracle that takes the time-weighted average price over multiple 
kind of blocks uh, and uses that as, as an Oracle price. Um, but the reason multi-block MEV can get quite bad is because you could end up in a world where people or I guess like stakers are uh, reorging the chain or at least attempting to reorg the chain uh, at least before finalization uh, in order to capture MEV. Now, this has been discussed before. Uh, it is extremely hard to do. It can be extremely costly to do. It is not something that is exactly feasible it, uh, and it's not it's probably not something that we're going to see play out live. But as MEV continues to grow, as maybe the bull market heats up again and we get more value coming back into the market from, uh, I guess, like regular users and things like that and more MEV opportunities popping up, this could become more of an issue. But I think with the solutions that have been worked on for some time, such as PBS and others, we're not going to be in like existential crisis mode uh, ever. I, I don't really think that at all. I think some people... Sometimes make it out as if we're, you know, close to that reality, but I don't think so at all personally. I mean, I obviously am not an expert here, but from all the smart people that I've spoken to and from the things that I've seen, everyone seems very, very optimistic about the future and about solving these issues at the kind of like consensus layer here. And it's not something that we should, quote unquote, delay the merge for. Because realistically, if we were to delay the merge in order to get all of these upgrades live to potentially defend against something that, uh, sorry, to defend against something that potentially could happen or had a, like a low probability of happening, it would realistically lead to probably a 12 plus month delay of the merge, which is untenable at this point. There is no way or there, there is no reality where that's going to happen. So we're going to go through with it. Yes, there's probably an increased risk and some, some centralization risks around there with MEV, but it is not something that is a death knell for Ethereum. It is not something that is unknown and not being worked on. It's just something that we have to, to work through and get these upgrades live, which as Proto says here is uh, much more, uh, I guess, like likely to happen now that the merge is is finished because if uh, the, mer the merge being finished frees up all these resources to work on these other upgrades. All right, so Summer Esat is out with his supplementary guide to staking on Ethereum for existing stakers. I think I highlighted this a couple of weeks ago, but Danny Ryan basically shared this again today. Uh, you should definitely go check this out if you're an existing solo stake. I just wanted to remind you guys again here on how to get set up. I mean, at this point, if you haven't followed these guides, the network would have kicked you off if you hadn't upgraded um, with, with Bellatrix already. So I'm sure you're kind of like scrambling or have been scrambling to get your validators back online. But if uh, you you kind of like, uh, are, even if you are a new staker, you should go check out uh, uh, some of ESAT's guides here if, you, if you're a new solo staker because they're linked in the supplementary guide. So I just wanted to highlight that once again for all of you uh, because I know that there, there's probably going to be new solo stakers coming online, especially post-merge, given that there is now going to be MEV opportunities, right, with MEV boost because uh, the execution layer is now part of the consensus, uh, sorry, the execution layer has been merged in with the beacon chain uh, and there's also going to be a bump up from the unburnt fear of a news in AP, a APR. So we could actually see including MEV, the current reward is, I think, just over 4% uh, for ETH staking. We could see 6 7%, and depending on how crazy the fear of you gets, even higher than that post-merge, I expect that to come down because more people are going to stake. Like, there's no way in hell that staking uh, the staking yield for ETH is going to stay at 6%. Like, that's just absolutely not going to happen. People are going to buy ETH and stake for that. That's a 6% ETH-denominated yield. That's crazy, especially if the ETH price is going up. People are going to get bullish. They're going to want to stake. And they're probably going to want a solo stake uh, because of the fact that solo staking can, uh, I mean, solo staking probably is going to be the most profitable way to to stake uh, in terms of just pure ETH denominated yield. But there are other ways. I mean, Rocket Pool obviously has their own incentives and there's going to be other staking providers with their own incentives as well. So, but it, all in all, I do believe, to, uh, I, I do think we're going to see an, up, uh, an uptick in solo stakers too. And if that is you, you can definitely follow some of ESAT's guides here on how to do that. All right, so Aztec Network is out with a fresh thread today about how to get fixed yield on a stablecoin using Aztec's Element Finance integration, which offers fixed yields up to 40 times cheaper than mainnet. So you can check this thread out. I'll link it in the YouTube description below. I believe I've highlighted uh, Element Finance being live on Aztec before on Aztec's uh, private DeFi layer and how you can tap into layer one liquidity and do all your transactions on Aztec privately. And I know, obviously, privacy has come under scrutiny. Ethereum-related privacy has come under scrutiny over the last few months with the Tornado Cash stuff and also Aztec uh, implementing some controls into their own layer here. But 
you can still use these things. You can still use them privately and you should definitely do so. You should definitely go play around with them. There is no sanctions on Aztec or anything like that, right? So you can play around with it without worrying about inter interacting with someone, something that's been sanctioned. Uh, you know, if, if they actually did sanction Aztec, I'd be very, uh, I'd be very surprised. Um, I think, I mean, I talked about this a lot already on the, on the previous refills about tornado cash and stuff. So I'm not going to rehash here, but I think that the privacy stuff kind of has taken a, a back seat uh over the last uh maybe two weeks since since it all died down uh but you know the tornado cash dev has still been arrested right uh there is still a lot of question marks around what these sanctions on tornado cash actually mean uh for block producers and and things like that so it's an ongoing thing, but in the meantime, you can still use Aztec Network. I mean, you can still use Tornado Cash if you wanted to, but you'd be breaking sanctions if you're a US citizen, but it's immutable. It's still on there, so you can still use it, but Aztec hasn't been sanctioned or anything like that, so you won't be taking any risks there, and you can use it with Element Finance. So yeah, you should definitely go check this out. I'll link the thread in the YouTube description below for you to do so. All right, so oh, this is what I wanted to highlight here, but I'm going to do that at last. Uh, so Gnosis Safe has rebranded to just Safe now. So this new brand, uh, it comes, I guess, on the launch of their, I should follow them, <laughs> on the launch of their uh, their token, or at least kind of like uh, their, their no, they, I think their token has launched yet, but their distribution details that were posted, I think a couple of weeks ago that I um, that I talked about on the on the refuel here. So definitely go follow the new account at Safe, uh, which they used to be at Gnosis Safe, now they're at Safe. Uh, I think because they've spun out of Gnosis, they're kind of just doing the rebranding here and they've got a new logo and everything like that. So cool to see that branding all come together. Now, Gnosis Safe, or should I say Safe, is still the biggest multi-sig on Ethereum by far. I don't know what's going to happen with the token. Like, tokens are so hard to comment on. Like, I, I, I avoid commenting on tokens on the refuel for obvious reasons. But just generally, whenever someone asks me, I, I kind of have the same opinion of like every token in, in crypto and every coin in crypto. My overarching like thesis on, on these things, and maybe I'm going a little bit off, off, off track here, but it may be interesting, is that the things that have the attention are the things that seem to do well over the long term. Now, if you look at the top 10 on CoinGecko, right, which isn't very pretty, and I've got it here in front of me, you can't see it on my screen, but the top 10, excluding stable coins, is BTC, ETH, BNB, uh, ADA, XRP, Sol, Dot, Doge, and SHIB. Uh, and I think Matic is in there, excluding the stable coins. Yeah. So what do all of these things have in common? Well, the thing that they all have in common is that like they've got attention all the time. I mean, BTC and ETH, no, there's no question there. They are always on people's mind. People are always talking about them. BNB may be an exception because... I don't see many people talking about it, but BNB is both tied to the largest crypto exchange in the world and also tied to the largest alt, uh, alt L1. Uh, and I, I think BNB's value is uh, closely controlled and protected by Binance considering the supply is so concentra concentrated. So it is a bit of an outlier there. Um, ADA, which is Cardano. I mean, as much as I think Cardano is a joke, uh, it has so much attention. There are so many people that still follow it, still pay attention to it. Same with XRP, which just puzzles me as to why, but there it is. Solana, same deal. I think the, the general consensus right now is that Solana is the top non-EVM alt L1, uh, at, 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 at least in terms of kind of like the, the sentiment that I've seen. And then you have Polkadot, which it doesn't have as much attention, but I think like Polkadot is, is, is kind of like there as a momentum thing. Like over time, there was a lot of hype for it. It's kind of like zombified and it keeps just falling down the rankings here. Uh, so yeah, that's another, maybe an outlier there. But then you look at Doge and, and uh, Dogecoin obviously still has a lot of attention and just generally has a lot of attention. SHIB, same thing. I just, it, it puzzles me as to why, but from especially from retail investors they love this sort of stuff obviously polygon gets a lot of attention and then you can kind of look through the rest of them but it's kind of funny because you even look at like if you're just ranking by market cap there are other things you have to take into consideration as well such as the fact that things have uh, I, I kind of like momentum and stickiness behind them. For example, XRP, uh, I, I don't think there's actually many large holders that are selling besides the Ripple Foundation themselves. I think the large holders are pretty much just exchanges with all these little fishes on there that don't really put a dent in the, in the market cap. So the market cap is not going to really move down uh, that all too much because the I, I believe the Ripple Foundation sells slowly over time and they're probably selling OTC uh, in, a, in a very controlled way. And that's not, not to say that OTC doesn't hit the market, but it seems that they've got like a very stickiness to them where they don't really, like the, the, as, a, as a saying with BNB, where the supply is quite controlled, right? 
And then, uh, you know, the other ones uh, out here, like like Doge, just been around for so long, just seems to be very relevant. A lot of the coins are lost. So the market cap, like just because a lot of the coins are lost, the market cap uh, is inflated because of that. Same with SHIB. Uh, I mean, that's an obvious one too, that, that no one ever expected it to do what it did. Uh, and then you, uh, there, there are many like this. I mean, like Ethereum Classic, right, for example. Litecoin, like there's just things that have had a lot of momentum behind them. But in terms of the top 10 itself, most of it is just based on on attention and uh, and also based on, I guess, like supply dynamics and, and concentration of supply there. But as I said, I don't like to comment too much on these sorts of things because you could debate this, uh, you know, for, forever, basically. But generally, my view on things is that the tokens, uh, there's thousands of them, right? They all have to compete with each other and they're all competing with each other for attention. And at the end of the day, there is only a finite amount of investor capital out there and whatever they don't put into that, uh, you know, one token they put into another means that that token didn't get that money. So for example, if people put all their money into ETH and not into BTC, well, that is a net loss to BTC. Uh, and I know it's weird for some people to think about that and some people disagree with me on, on this line of thinking, but at the end of the day, like if more people put money into ETH instead of BTC, then ETH is going to outperform BTC. That's just a simple math of it. And I think that we've been seeing that over the last few months, especially. Um, but, but yeah, I think that applies to basically everything in, in crypto and especially over the longer term. It's more, it's also about like what money gets kept in that and how fast people are to dump it. Like with BTC and ETH, they're much slower to dump that, dump those things than they are to dump other things things because of the risk curve as well and the riskiness associated with them. But it real, over the long term, it really is an attention game. There are things from 2017 and 2018 that were extremely hyped up and were the, like, the talk of the entire industry. And now they don't even register in like the top one, two, 300 on, on CoinGecko, right? So, and that's because they lost the attention game and they, when they lose the attention game. They lose their, their user base. They lose people, people wanting to build on them if they're a layer one or something like that. And the project just fails. So I think attention plays an extremely important part. Maybe this is a tangent. I started talking about Gnosis Safe here, and now I'm talking about different token dynamics. But I think it's something to, to consider and something very important that uh, that you should definitely think about and maybe incorporate into your own in investing strategy. But that's not investment advice. It's just the way I think about things. And I think that if you look at the proof is in the pudding, really. It's it's it, ETH and BTC outperform pretty much everything over the long term because they have the most attention. But that's only one facet of it. I'm not saying that it's only attention, but I think attention is a big one because if things don't have attention, then no one really wants to not be involved with it. The price kind of like stagnates. People, people, you know, keep selling and the price keeps going down. And then it kind of leads to this negative spiral where they lose, lose more attention and all that sorts of stuff there. But, uh, but yeah, I'm going to leave it at that. Definitely go follow the safe Twitter account here because I think they'll be tweeting from safe instead of Gnosis safe going forward. All right, last up here, I have something that I forgot to shout out the other day, or at least I, maybe I did shout it out, which is a fresh video from Bankless, and, and this one comes from David Hoffman himself, about the Ethereum merge. And this is a normie or noob-friendly video about the Ethereum merge that you can share with people that may still not be understanding what exactly the Ethereum merge is. So I'll link this in the YouTube description for you to share this. I thought it was a really great video. You should definitely go watch it as well. Uh, it's not too long, and I thought David did a really great job here, uh, but, uh, but I'll link it below for you. But on that note, that's going to be it for today. So thank everyone for listening and watching. Be sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Give the video a thumbs up, subscribe to the newsletter, join the Discord channel, and I'll catch you all tomorrow. Thanks everyone.